but some rewarding moments that I've had when I see the light bulb, like if I am explaining, um, you know, how audio is used in storytelling, and then I see a light bulb go off, or, you know, students make a connection with something that is, that we talk about in class, and they make a connection with it, like, in the real world. Um, or, you know, students just say, you know, your class is so different from other classes that I've had, or, um, you know, I really enjoy your class, or um, so-and-so told me I should take this class, but I wasn't going to, but I'm glad you're my professor, you know? So it's like, it's things like that. Y'all know, when I started this podcast, my goal was to be able to share the world with my network. And I also had another goal to be able to meet some other professionals along the way and perhaps get to learn their stories. So on this episode, I'm happy to say that that is one of the goals I accomplished. I was able to meet the one and only Miss Professor Taylor Shaw via episode when Deontay Smith was on here. She reached out to me and asked me to be uh, guest speaker for her class after having such a great time I said I need to have her on I want to interview her I want to find out her story and through this conversation I was able to do so so sit back and listen and I promise you no I guarantee you you'll get a lot of great advice from Professor Taylor Shaw <laughs> All right, folks, on the line, I have social media strategist and professor, the one and only Miss Taylor Shaw. Taylor, how are you doing today? Hi, I am doing great. I hope you are. So I'm honored to have you on the show. Uh, recently, you invited me to come speak to your class, which yes. I'm like, wow, like this is a true honor. Somebody want to hear me speak about podcasting, but, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate that. And, you know, I know that you know obviously looking over your resume and stuff you have a huge story to share with the world and by you being a teacher you also have a different perspective so i can't wait to really talk about that but i have to ask you so what made you want to get into the media business like was it something you dreamed of as a child like when did you first decide this is what you wanted to do yeah so i um like the cliche is, I was bitten by the news bug at a young age. Um, but it wasn't until high school that I um, took part in the Chuck Stone program at the University of North Carolina. And it was a week-long journalism program for high school students. And that is where, um, and it, like Chuck Stone, he's one of the founding members of NABJ. Um, and so that was where I found news and like saw news as like a career of writing and um, producing content. Um, so I was like a high school junior, I believe, um, taking part in that program. And in college, I studied communication. I have my master's degree in broadcast journalism. Um, but yeah, so it started in high school when I found out about news as a career. Now, was there any, oh, sorry, was there anybody in particular you looked up to? Ooh. Like, as when you was in high school, like, local or national? Um, yeah, so I guess, like, high school for me, like, growing up, my mom told me, look, <laughs> you either become a doctor, you can become a nurse, a dentist, a lawyer, a teacher. <laughs> like, those are, like, my five <laughs> career choices that my mom gave me. Um, especially uh -huh. coming from a family of nurses. Oh, um, okay. So I looked outside of that and wanted to be a TV reporter um, at one point <laughs> in my life. I, and that's kind of the idea that I had for my career in college. And it wasn't until grad school that I shifted gears and focused more on online storytelling, digital storytelling, and social media. Now, what, um, when you told them that you wanted to we'll start with TV, we told them you wanted to be a TV reporter. What was their reaction? They were supportive. 
Um, I think it took my mom, like, because, you know, like I said, like most of my family, they're nurses, so um, they were supportive, but more so like trying to figure out what that looked like. Mm -hmm. Um, And because, like, I've always been the type of person that wanted to be involved, so, like, I had internships at different news stations. I was a part of my college's student newspaper, and in my senior year, I was editor-in-chief of the newspaper, um, joining professional organizations like NABJ and um, meeting people that are in the field and networking and kind of cultivating those relationships um, because I because I had that knowledge and that knack and that passion, like this is what I want to do, um, my mom is, it came around. <laughs> she came around. <laughs> so now what made you change your mind from – being in front of the camera to doing more like behind the scenes and the strategy stuff. Yeah. So I really, like I mentioned in grad school, that's kind of where, because my, my master's degree is in broadcast journalism. Um, but I took a few classes in Wikipedia and the public opinion and online news production. And I really loved the creative side of, producing content and um, taking something that's complex and then maybe creating some sort of interactive graphic to help better tell a story. Um, I really enjoyed that. And my first job out of grad school, I um, went to um, or I moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, and I worked at a TV station on the digital side. Um, So using Facebook Live and using social media and writing stories for the web, that was that was my jam, my first job out of grad school. Uh, so now, I mean, before we get to the job, I want to ask you, and you know, that way you can kind of inspire the listeners out there. Uh, primarily, the listeners are people who really looking for inspiration, looking for um, just kind of a way. Um, so that's what I love to do with this show. Uh, why did you decide to go to grad school? Because sometimes people will say it's not necessary in media. And some people say it is, and I've heard both sides of the argument. So I'm always interested in uh, pros. Mm -hmm. Um, So I went to grad school. So I worked for a year. So after undergrad, I worked for a community newspaper in my hometown of Durham, North Carolina. Um, I worked at the Triangle Tribune and I um, was a reporter and editor. So I was writing stories for that appeared in print, that, and they also appeared online. And I um, additionally, on top of that, because like I wanted to be a TV reporter at that time, um, I was creating news packages. I was creating video packages with a tripod that I bought from Walmart, um, a Zoom camera. I don't know if you remember those. They're like the little yep. cameras that are about this a little bit smaller than your cell phone, and you could easily, um, it had a USB that you could easily, like, download videos um, from the camera to your computer, and then um, I would edit on iMovie. So I created these kind of natural sound with interview and editing videos to go with my news story. That was something, like, additionally that I did because at this time I wanted to be a TV reporter, so I was, like, trying to produce content. And so I wanted to go to grad school because I felt like I did not have a broadcast journalism. I didn't feel like I had enough broadcast journalism experience to get a TV job because my background was in or is in mass communication. That's my, um, sorry, not my background. My major was in mass communication. Um, So I wanted to get more of that broadcast journalism side. So I decided to get a master's degree. Um, I knew that also one day I wanted to teach as well. So I was like, okay, well, this seems like the right thing for me to do. Um, <laughs> so on the other side of that, because hindsight is always twenty twenty, I um, like I tell my students, because I do teach now, um, don't go to grad school because you don't 
have a job after graduation. And grad school seems like something where you can say that you're doing something after graduation. But it's okay to not graduate with a job. Like, it's okay as long as you are taking the time from the time that you graduate until the time that you find your first job. If you're using that time applying for jobs, networking, mentor, like finding a mentor, you know, owning your craft, then that's time well spent, even if you are working at a restaurant <laughs> um, so you're able to pay bills until you land your first TV job or your first job in media. Um, but I don't think grad school should be a – well, I, didn't, I don't have a job. I, well, I graduated in May. I don't have a job. I'm going to go get my master's degree because I need something to do or I, I don't I, – I need somewhere to – I didn't get a job, so I'm just going to go get a master's degree. I think that's a very expensive mistake, and I think that if you're going to go to graduate school, I think there should be some intention behind it. Like, why do you want a master's degree? Do you want to dig deeper into analytics or do you want to learn more about X, Y, or Z? So I think definitely there should be some sort of intention behind wanting to further your education. Wow, that may be one of the most important nuggets in the history, uh, small history, of breaking through glass ceilings. And I really (laughs) hope everybody take out a pen and paper and write that down because that's very important. so you mentioned being at the news station and you discussed, um, you started to talk about like Facebook live. If I'm not mistaken around that time, you're really at the forefront of the infancy as news stations are really starting to utilize it more. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, that was like th- 2014, okay. 2014, 2015 when Facebook live just came out. So news stations were trying to figure out, okay, we have this new tool, how can we use it? How can we reach our audiences? How can we tell stories using this platform? So you are absolutely correct. It was a lot of experimenting, um, a lot of like trying to engage with our audience and exploration. And those, ex- like exploring, ex- um, experimenting and engaging are kind of where my passions with social media and digital media, media come from. Now you, I'm assuming at this point, you're also teaching a lot of veterans, right? A lot of people who have been in the business because you're coming in a younger mind. Social media is really something you grew up on and something they didn't. So can you talk about that experience as far as teaching them? Yes. And I think that's like a, that's a common thread in the jobs that I've taken. Um, There has been a, a coaching or um, a coaching role, and it may not have said that in the job description, but that's something that I've done because you you have to make people feel comfortable with social media. Because to some people, it was scary. It was like, you want me to do what? Like, I'm already writing. I'm already producing news packages, and this is one more thing that I have to do. So a lot of my job was how can I make this, not seem like something extra, but make it so it's a thing that can help you reach your audience because that's where the audiences are or, you know, that's where they are. Like no one's going to wait till 5 o'clock to watch you on TV. You have to engage with your audience throughout the day, and you can do that with Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, using social media, and also on the web um, because we all know that that's 24-7. Now, did you um, also have to deal with uh, Periscope and Meerkat? I did not. Um, So I think, like, as a social media person, you know that there are so many tools and there's so many platforms, but you have to decide which ones you want to focus on. So I did not focus on um, Periscope or Meerkat, but mainly Facebook and Twitter. Those are the two that... I focused on. And I think that's just good practice with social media is that you can't be everywhere. You need to figure out where um, where's your audience or like where's the people that you're trying to reach and find a way to reach them on those platforms. Okay. Yeah. Cause I was, I know when I was at ESPN, we were 
when I got I got the social media team in March 2015 and they had that's when Meerkat had came out. Then next thing you know, they told us, "Yeah, we're soon going to be moving over to Periscope, and mm-hmm. we would do a lot of while the show was like in, during the commercials for the Midnight Sports Center." Uh, shout out to Robert Flores and Jay Harris. They would go live on uh, Periscope to do you know talk and engage with the fans, and so I thought that was really cool. And it's amazing to see how like now, and sometimes I think everybody shouldn't have access to Facebook live. Unfortunately, we've yeah. seen it as a benefit um, for some things, but there's some, I was like, come on. Like, you know, like I got a cousin, I love him to death, but sometimes he just go live just to be showing he cooking on the grill. I'm like, dude, okay. We did it. <laughs> you know, go just, just FaceTime, just do a group fat, a group chat and FaceTime or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now, um, you so after you left the news uh yeah the news business you decided to go into the um healthcare right yeah so right now i um i'm on the social media team for a health insurance company in durham north carolina blue now, cross and blue shield in north carolina so i'm assuming cuz i've kind of did the same thing do you have a better work life balance yes I do. I do. I do. Like holidays, um, like five o'clock, when five o'clock hits or whenever, you know, sometimes it's four o'clock, then I can release. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, I don't feel glued to my phone. Um, So, yes, I do have a better work-life balance. But actually, I like to say work-life chemistry, and that's something uh, that I learned in a leadership program because it, it just changes the way that you look at those two things because, like, I don't think it will ever be balanced, but I think if you learn how to – how work and your life can ebb and flow together, I think that's, like, a better a better way to look at those two things. Wow. I like that. I'm going to use that. Thank you. See? Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're welcome. welcome. <laughs> now, when did you um, – I'm going to talk about before we actually let's stay right there. Uh, what has been some of your what's been the rewarding part of working um, in healthcare for you? The rewarding part, I would say that. So this is my first job outside of news, and it has been rewarding because I have learned that. Storytelling is the same. Like, even though the industry for me has changed, like, I'm no longer in news, I'm now in healthcare. Um, storytelling, telling a good story, keeping your readers engaged or your viewers engaged, that is still the same. So, these, the things that I've learned in newsrooms, um, like coaching and um, coming up with strategy and writing, those things can be applied to just about anything. So I feel like because I have these strong roots in journalism and, you know, wanting still being a storyteller, even though I'm not necessarily in the news industry, that has been rewarding because it's it's very cross-functional. And um, I'm still learning. I'm still growing every day. And so I, I would say that's the rewarding part is that um, – to continue growing as a storyteller, even though the industry for me has changed. Now, was there an adjustment period where, you know how like in journalism, everything's so fast paced. So you get an assignment, you do it right away. You get an assignment, you want to hurry up, get it. Was there an adjustment period, uh, especially working with other people who may not have came with, came from a journalism background who may not have that sense of urgency the way you would have been used to? Um, I would, I would still say there's a sense of urgency. It's not, but it's different. Like it's a different, uh, something that's motivating or the, the force behind it. So like in news, it's, you know, we want to be, if it's breaking news, you know, we want to be the first to report it, but we also want to be accurate. Um, 
and wanting to keep our communities informed. And I think some of those same things are can be applied. But the the rush or the urgency is different. It's more so deadline driven or, you know, we have an announcement that we want to share and how can we um, create a social media strategy around health insurance education and how can we keep people informed. So I think that the urgency is a little bit different. It's more deadline because this has to go, this has to be posted rather than this is breaking news. There's a, a five car crash on Interstate 40. Or something. And do you sometimes find yourself missing news? Yes and no. See, that's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just the just local news. Um, I miss I miss the people that I worked with. Mm-hmm. Um, I miss kind of those newsroom traditions. Um, you know, like we are working towards you know, keeping people informed, holding people accountable. Like I, I miss, I miss the, the people that I worked with, the environment. Um, but I don't miss like the long hours or I don't miss, you know, the, see, that's a hard, see, it's a hard question. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm torn. And that's, that's no, that's no, shade or disrespect to TV journalists, but, you know, it, it kind of, it wears on you, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot of, um, you know, sometimes it's doom and gloom um, and lots of sad times with, you know, the stories that we're covering. So, yeah. No, and yes and no. I can totally understand exactly where you're coming from. Um, you know, I did sports news. I mean, I've worked, I uh, interned at a local newspaper. Mm-hmm. And so I think a lot of times for me personally, I miss being in the know um, or always, you know, kind of being, you know, like when, especially like uh, in sports, when there's like a big event, being right there and seeing things unfold in front of your eyes, as opposed to if breaking news happens in sports and I get it, it's nobody in the, um, it may be like two people in my office where before you just talk to whoever's right near you. Hey, did you hear this about so-and-so now it's just like, Oh, I got to find somebody to talk to this about. So I can understand, like you said, missing the people and sometimes that environment. Um, Now you're a professor. This is how we met. You're a professor at um, Shaw university. Yeah. I know your mom was happy when you got that position because she told you to teach, right? Say that one more time. I said, I know your family had to been happy because teaching was one of the things they wanted you to do, right? Well, my mom, after I graduated with my degree, she was like, all right, girl, you in it, let's do it. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But that's something that I wanted to do. Like, I wanted to be a professor. Um, Mm -hmm. So this is my second year teaching at Shaw University. And it is, I really enjoy it. (laughs) I love teaching I love that was this something you decided you wanted to do while you were in um, undergrad it was like maybe an idea okay but it wasn't until um like my master's program I was just like okay you know I was like I could teach one day I think I could do this um because I was also a teaching assistant I don't know if I mentioned this I um, got my master's degree from American University And so I was also a teaching assistant for, like, at the end of my program for the the next class. Um, And I, I really, I really enjoy it or enjoyed it. And so um, when, and I actually met um, the division head at Shaw University, Dr. Mitchell. I met her at um, the News and Observer where I worked. So I worked in a newspaper. This was my last job before moving to healthcare on the social media team. And um, students came in for a tour, and my boss, Eric Frederick, was like, Kayla, do you want to talk to some students about News Observer? And I was like, sure. And I talked to them like six minutes, just explaining um, 
what we do, the role that social media plays, um, kind of like my a brief career path for me and just share that with students. Like I literally talked to them for six minutes and because um, I think they were just touring other newsrooms in the area. And so um, I kept in touch with Dr. Mitchell and she had an opening for an adjunct and I took it. <laughs> and that's where I am now. Now, how many classes do you teach? Um, so total, I teach um, multimedia convergence, which is how do we tell stories online. Um, I teach reporting and writing, and I teach the university's first social media management course. Wow. So those are the three classes. Not all at the same time, <laughs> but just like <laughs> within the time that I've been at Shaw, those are the classes that I teach. Oh, so that's pretty cool. So with social media management, that's um, is that kind of like balance and, and apps and reporting analytics and teaching them how to do that? Yes. Yeah, so I, I really take the hands-on approach with my classes. Mm -hmm. Is that like, yes, I want you to learn, but I also want you to do. Um, and so each class, I want students to leave the course with something that they can then show off at an for an internship interview or for a job. So with the social media class, um, I partnered with Hootsuite. They have an, age, um, an educational program. And so through at, by the end of the course, students were able to become Hootsuite certified. So that's some great like tool that you can put in your toolbox and then put it on your resume. So then you have something to talk about with a employer or a possible internship. Um, so it's mainly thinking about content creation, um, social media, and the ins and outs of all the platforms, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram, um, but also thinking about how journalists use social media versus a public relations uses social media versus marketers using social media. Um, so that's like my syllabus in a, in a nutshell. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, I noticed that your students, after I, you know, spoke, they were, I was getting, like, you told me be on the lookout. I would get a lot of tweets and I noticed that they all looked to be fresh accounts. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, you know, and it, it, social media has come a long way and it's really, I would tell people for businesses, it's, it's like the phone was in the, I guess the sixties or the seventies at first people thought, Oh, I could just run my business and use and handle the phone. But when those phone mm -hmm. calls started coming in, they was like, Whoa, I need to get somebody to do this. Cause this is a full-time job. And the same with social media, people think, Oh yeah, I got a business. I can just do it. But if you don't know what you're doing, you could get lost. Right. Yep. Yeah. Now what's, um, now you've been, so you, this is your second year. What has been, I guess like, What's been one of the most rewarding things as a teacher? I've had a lot of rewarding moments. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, feel free I, to drop them all. Yeah, so, I mean, I I think my students are great. I have, um, like, my OG students. <laughs> so my OG students are the students that I had, like, my first year. Um, so my first year, first semester, it was reporting and writing. And so... That class, I consider them my OGs because then they took other classes with me. Um, and so, like, because I'm new to teaching, <laughs> like, I um, am able to take what I learned, like, one year and then see how I can tweak it for the next class or for the next class. Um, but some rewarding moments that I've had when I see the light bulb, like, if I am explaining um, – you know, how audio is used in storytelling, and then I see a light bulb go off, or, you know, students make a connection with something that is, that we talk about in class, and they make a connection with it, like, in the real world, um, or, you know, students just say, you know, your class is so different from other classes that I've had, or, um, you know, I really enjoy your class, or, um so-and-so told me I should take this class, but I wasn't going to, but I'm glad you're my professor, you know? So it's like, it's things like that. And I think, um, I, I know, I'm very aware that I 
don't look like the other professors. Um, like my students and I were much closer in age. Um, they still call me Miss Shaw or they call me Professor Shaw. But they do not call me Taylor. Um, side note, I did have one student who, like, she graduated on a Saturday. That Monday, she sent me an email saying, hey, Taylor. It was just like, it was so funny. Um, I think she was she was waiting to call me by my first name. Um, oh, but anyway, no. so <laughs> she just couldn't, she couldn't wait. Um, but... I use the closeness in age to my advantage mm -hmm. because I try to relate it to things that they're going through right now. Um, and I'm also very honest with my students, like the whole grad school conversation that we, we had earlier in the podcast. I have that same conversation with my students um, because I want them to use me as a resource um, to kind of help them navigate finding an internship, finding a job, going to – or furthering your education if that's what you decide to do, um, mentoring and networking and coaching, um, how they're, they're so important in trying to connect students to people or places or things that can help them, like, land their first job. Because that's the goal, right? Like, I want to see them get a job in their field. That's, that's phenomenal. Now – I'm sitting here like, cause I'm, I'm just like blown away by all the knowledge I'm getting here. <laughs> so, <laughs> and generally, you know, I ask questions that people would ask or that I think people would need to know. So I'm gonna ask some questions for myself. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's hear somebody it. Somebody who would, would want to teach one day. I don't, I ain't ready to do it just yet. I got a lot going on, but if something that's something I would want to do. What kind of advice would you share as far as preparation? The first year is always the hardest because it's a lot of planning. and okay. But I think it's good planning because for me, I'm thinking about what I know. Like, I know that there's so much that could be learned about media, communication, public relations, social media. There's so much that can be learned. But what do you want? students to leave with? Like, what is the tangible thing that they can walk out of your class knowing or having? Um, so I think that for me, that is kind of where you start with the planning. Um, I can honestly say that it's very rewarding. It, it doesn't feel like a job, if that makes sense. It just feels like helping. And I think definitely having an impact with your students where um, they're able to talk to you and they can open up to you and they come to you for advice. <laughs> like, I think, I think that is, um, it's rewarding. And I, I, I think that being able to support your students no matter where life takes them or, you know, the things that they come across. I think that just keeping that in mind can definitely um, inspire someone to become a professor. And, I, I mean, I, I don't think that, like, I would not want to teach high school. I do not want to teach elementary school or anything lower. Like, I want – I think college is just right, it's just right for me. <laughs> yeah, I see um, my wife teaches seventh grade, I think it's seventh grade, uh, and she teaches all, at an all-boys school. Oh, wow. And, and I see <laughs> the um, planning process, and I had mentioned it to her. She was like, oh, you would be good at it. And this time, I was like, yeah, but looking at you sitting there with all those lesson plans. <laughs> yeah, but see, that's a different I'm, calling. That's the different yeah. calling. <laughs> it, it is. And, and I think, um, you know, we're recording this as we're in the middle of COVID-19. I posted on Facebook yesterday that I don't think so many parents will be quick to say, that's not my child. My child don't do this. Or my child don't do that because 
you getting to teach somebody put up a uh instagram meme and it said the first day of rona uh rona elementary it was like the parent <laughs> Gary beat the child <laughs> I have enjoyed the the memes coming out of COVID-19, coronavirus. I have enjoyed them. They bring me peace during this difficult time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. And um, how are you? So I, I know you've used Zoom uh, during this time. How mm-hmm. have you been able to keep your students motivated? And, you know, because it can be, I, I would think it could be easy to slack off, especially before, when I was in school, and it was, wasn't that long ago, it was 2012, 2013, my um, final year, a snowstorm would have us doing like an online session. And we at that time, it was like Google Hangouts and stuff. But you mm-hmm. knew you was going to eventually go back to class. In this situation where students aren't going back to class, yeah. nine times out of 10, how are you able to keep them motivated? Because I could say that when I was uh, speaking to your class, they all seemed to be like present. Yeah, there was, you know, like you said, some of them were like in bed because it was a eight o'clock class, but they all seemed like interested. And I think that's a huge testament to you and your work being able oh, to you. make them say, yes, we want to do this because we're we're actually getting something out of this. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, this is, I think this is the second, this is the second week for students. I want to say second or third week that students have been back in class virtually. Um, And so, I mean, I have just made it, just being completely transparent with students saying, hey, you know, I'm going through the same thing you guys are. Um, And just keeping the communication lines open, um, saying, you know, here, you can email me anytime I'm here for you. I think that having the video conferences, the, the Zoom calls, that really helps because everyone is able to see everyone else. Um, like I have some students that are back in DC or they're in California or they're in South Carolina. Um, so they can still feel connected and still have that like community um, and ask questions. Um, so yeah, I just think just extending my just having open communication and extending um, help <laughs> or just saying you know I'm I'm here for you. We're in this together, um, and 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 making sure that they're being held accountable as well. Yeah, well, like I said, you're doing a great job, and it's they. I hope I, I think they will realize how blessed they are to have you as their professor um before i let you go like i said i definitely appreciate you we can keep talking this has been great (laughs) okay i have never been on a podcast before so this is great yeah we can have a a a deep cut an extended cut it's up to you i'm I'm happy like i said i'm happy to be a resource so if there are other questions that either you or like people who are listening you guys can follow me on all the things. Um, Taylor C. Shaw, if you have questions, I'm, like, I'm happy to help. And because, I mean, I think that's also kind of where I, why I enjoy teaching and why I give back is because I have someone do that for me. Like I've had mentors who have put in a good word for me if I ask them for a job reference or have written a letter of recommendation for me for grad school or, you know, people that I can go to that I can talk to. So I want to make sure that people have those same support system that I did because, like, I have so many people to thank for being here. And I feel like I'm I'm just getting, like, I'm not, I'm so young, you know, so I'm still moving on up. As the Jeffersons would say, that's the Jeffersons, right? Yeah. Yep. That's... <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, yeah, like, I think that's also why I'm just so passionate about helping students is because I had people help me when I was a student. You sure we're not related? <laughs> you know what? We could be cousins. I do have some family <laughs> in Baltimore. Oh, okay. <laughs> I do. So you never I, know. I know, right? 
<laughs> well, my theory is, as far as I know, it was one Adam and one Eve, so <laughs> it's all related somehow. But um, are you, we we talked about NABJ, but we didn't like really jump into it. What uh, what was your first convention? Ooh, 2012, and that was in New Orleans. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, did you? So you were a student, right? I'm assuming. Yes. Okay, yes. can you talk about that experience? Oh man, it was overwhelming. <laughs> it was a <laughs> lot. I think everyone's first NABJ is always overwhelming because there's so many people around and you feel so small. But once you start talking to people and meeting other people, then you know, you, like you get comfortable. And um, I mean, I remember. I guess you would. I guess I'm considered an NABJ baby because I took part in the NABJ short course in undergrad and again in grad school. Um, and so, like my first convention was, it was it was what I needed um, mm-hmm. at that time because I was introduced to so many people and like going to the sessions and handing out business cards and learning how to network. Um, but then also meeting other students who are in the same boat that I was in. Um, cause it's, and now it's like it's a family reunion where, you know, these are the only times that I see people that, you know, I see them every year at NABJ. So, um, but, yeah, so first NABJ was a little overwhelming, but once you get now your you, sea legs. Which short course did grow. you go to? I went to the one at A&T. Which year? 2000, it's either 12 or 11. Okay, so I was in 13. Gotcha, and, okay. And so did you go to the short course before the convention, your first convention, or after? I think it was that same year. Okay. Yeah, because the short course is only in, like, March or something, and then yeah. Then I so went then, to the convention. Okay, so now, like, because I did the same thing, and I think for me, it helped because by me going to the short course first, I knew a handful of people. I mean, so now Mm -hmm. it also helped us because uh, Dwayne Wickham had just became the, um, he had left North Carolina A&T as their, um, I guess their dean. And he came to Morgan and became the dean there before he changed it over to the School of Global Journalism. And he paid for all, all of the students who were NABJ members, he paid for our registration. So oh, we wow. Went, yeah, so we went down there. It was about 20 of us. And that's what kind of, it was still like overwhelming for some of us, but for a few of us, for me, it was helpful because I'm down there introducing my short course family to my Morgan family. Uh, and some oh, of wow. Short, yeah, and some of my short course family didn't have um people they came with they would just by themselves with their university so they would see a few of the other short course members and then obviously the mentors so that part was cool and then but it seemed like you go from a rookie to a veteran uh quickly because i think the next so the next i went to the convention in dc but i only went to the party that friday night so i went down because well because i was i way to do it (laughs) <laughs> right this is my first year at Hopkins and I didn't know like I could have went as um you know they would have paid for me to go they did then um uh, later but I went uh and I didn't want to take the time off so I was like all right well I won't go but what I'll do that Friday night me and my buddies we got in the car we drove to DC hung out in a hotel you know network with people and then went to the party then the following year um my manager told me that I could go to New Orleans. She says, you know, go basically go let the uh, journalists know about what we do at Hopkins. And that was great. And, but it felt like then I, you know, thanks to group me, it helped because you had a lot of people who I had talked to in the group chats and they said, this is their first time. I said, all right, don't worry about it. I'm going to make sure that you won't be so uh, nervous because you at least will we'll know each other beforehand and we'll finally mm-hmm. put a face to a name in person um did you go last year in miami i did not oh, 
I did not. That was like one NABJ that I did not want to go to. For real? That was just going to be overwhelming to me. Like, I don't really like crowds, and I feel like okay. that would have been very hectic and just not the right environment for me. So uh, I decided was, not to go. It was crowded. Um, I didn't stay. This is the first year I didn't stay in a host hotel. Thankfully, okay. because it was a resort. So it was like the fees, even though my job was paying for it, it was still like, you know, you got to put like the credit card and all that other stuff. And so the fees were just out of this world, but it was, it was a lot of fun. I have to say, and it, for me personally, it fell on my birthday, like that Wednesday oh, wow. <laughs> it was my birthday. So I was like, you know, and then they had like the little boat party that night. So I got to have, I was literally with my friends and family on my birthday. So um gotcha. unfortunately i kind of think dc is going to get canceled or postponed at least no we got to speak positive we the coronavirus is going to be gone and we're going to have nabj with nahj as originally planned okay, okay. hey I, I, hey i will never i will never, never deny that um but, excuse me I think that, um, like, with the Miami, like, I just think Miami, the city has that draw where it's, like, everyone wants to go to Miami mm-hmm. compared to, like, Milwaukee. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. some people are like, oh, I think I'll pass the Milwaukee, but I'll go See, to no, Miami. Like, I'm, for me, I'm like, okay, I'm going to pass the Miami because it's just it's a little, it's a bit much for me. I was mad I missed Detroit because – I found out that I could go later and <clears throat> sorry, my um, manager was like, first she said, okay, you go to NABJ this year. Next year, I want you to find a social media conference to go to. Cool. Then she was like, why aren't you going to NABJ? I said, you said find a social media conference. Well, yeah, NABJ can be your annual conference. I'm like, oh man, I missed out on Detroit. Wish I could have missed out on Canada too, because I've never oh, been, but yeah. I'm actually looking forward to, I know people have been like not super excited about some of the cities such as Birmingham and Cleveland. I'm actually looking forward to that because it's an opportunity to see somewhere different. Exactly. You know? Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, like, even with these medical conferences, I've never been to California. I got a chance to go to San Jose. That was fun. Uh, Chicago and uh, Vegas went there because of um, medical conferences. So, have you had um, any chances to do any um, go to any conferences for work yet? I went to um, the digital summit that was in Raleigh, North Carolina last year. Um, but this year, instead of going to a conference, I got a certification um, mm-hmm. in social media strategy. So that was like my handoff. It's like I rather do a certification than go to a conference. Okay. Now, have you ever been to um, Social Shake Up or you heard about that one? I have heard about it. I have not gone. Yeah, I Should I put either. it on my list for this year if according to, <laughs> Yeah, according to my coworker, it's a really good it's, one. But I'm not going to okay. lie to you. I, uh, I'm going to take NABJ over everything. <laughs> so if it's like, if I can only get one, give me NABJ. Uh, just right. Because it's so much you can learn there. Um, That's true. What, what would your advice be? Because people hear me talk about it all the time. It, it, it's almost so on, let's see, we're on episode 21. And I think 16 of them have been with uh, <laughs> black journalists or media okay. people. That's okay. a part of NABJ. But I always like for somebody to share some NABJ advice because one, I don't, so I'm, I've, I, you know, you, you're on social media, you see people, they everybody you can't make everybody happy all the time but i'm one that i'm very passionate about the organization because mm-hmm. it's done so much for me i mean i got a job at espn through an abj so yeah. like what would your advice be to people who are attending the first time or you know yeah who are attending the first time um i would say don't let yourself keep you from taking it all in, like don't get in your head, don't um, look around you and then compare yourself to someone else, don't do that. Be confident in yourself and in your skills. Um, And so that's one, so be confident in yourself and your skills. Number two, um, for the ladies, comfortable shoes. (laughs) 
comfort over everything. Um, and I would say me, I'll be open to meeting new people. Like if you're if you're in the elevator with someone and they have an NABJ badge on, check up a conversation. If you're standing in line at um, waiting to get into a session or a panel session, strike up a conversation with someone. Um, so, like, always talk to people and, and be friendly. Um, but I would also say – what else? Join your local chapter. Like, even though, like, the national convention is great every year, but there's so many of the – there's local chapters everywhere that still need um, participants and get involved with your, your local chapter or see how you can volunteer or help um, with the chapter in your city or town. That's important. Um, <clears throat> shout out to uh, my friends, uh, Nikki Mayo and David Steele uh, and uh, Benet Wilson from the Baltimore Association of Black Journalists chapter. Yes. You know, you I know Benet and Aunt Benet and I know Mickey. Aunt Benet. Hey, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is with the local chapter it's having that resource right there and one thing i love what we do is we um have one we have like so many sessions but one of the things that's very key that i wish i would have knew about while i was in college was um, having like resume reel where it's free you come in somebody will look over your resume look over your reel give you honest feedback and critique mm -hmm. And they help you. And, you know, she, Nikki does a great job at getting people who are working in the industry, you know, um, not, I don't want to say has been, but maybe somebody who hasn't done it in so long. No, she gets people who are currently in the industry, people you are looking at on television coming in, people who are, and she also gets hiring managers and producers. So you get to ask the questions and find out what they're looking for. But then we also have, and that's always like right before the national convention. So mm -hmm. to be able to get that preparation, free preparation, right before going to the convention, like that's a blessing. So I'm always like, you know, I put I, <laughs> I put on the pom poms for NABJ and BABJ <laughs> because I, I just think it's we as black folks need to stick together, <laughs> bottom line. And I don't think uh, we do that in all cases, but I definitely think, you know, we should. <laughs> yeah. So. And I actually, when I was in um, graduate school in Washington, DC, I went up to Baltimore for that resume critique. Um, back in what, 2014, 2013, 2014. Um, okay. So yeah, yeah that and was it was Connecticut then. <laughs> yeah. And it was me and Deontay Smith, who I know was also a guest on this podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, we went, were in the same cohort, and we went up to Baltimore to that to that um, session because it and it was great to have that feedback on our resume. Um, because like you know, you always want to grow, you always want to get better. So I took a program, and it said feedback is a gift. That's what they told us. It's just like one of the things because we were it was a um, design thinking program, and um, the moderator kept saying feedback is a gift. And if you think about it, it is because like you can either take it or you can leave it and or you can take pieces of it or however it suits you. But I mean, that's the best way to grow and to get better is with feedback. Yeah. Here's some notes I'm learning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> uh, you put that on the shirt so I can buy it. You said it first. So <laughs> you put that on the shirt. I'll buy it so I can wear it. I can imagine I wearing that side hustle. Side <laughs> hustle selling t shirts. There you go. All right. So um now, you know, I'm gonna let you get out of here. But you just remind the people where they can follow you, where they can find you and connect with you because you are folks, she's absolutely positively somebody you need, not want, need, <laughs> not suggested, but need to be in contact with. So, Michelle, can you let people know where they can find you? Yeah. So, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Taylor C. Shaw. Um, that's basically 
for everything is Taylor C. Shaw. Um, so you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, so, yeah, I am happy to be a resource and happy to help when and where I can. And, Ryan, thank you for inviting me on your podcast. This was great. No problem. Thank you so much for coming on. Yes, this was this was fabulous. This was a great uh, end to my week. So this was this was great. I have something to look forward to this week. So I'm happy we we're able to connect. And thank you for coming to my class virtually no and talking about podcasting. Yeah, anytime. You know, I'd be happy to do it again. Anytime, and you know, um, I've I've seen like some of the students I follow. Some of them follow back. So. They, uh, you know, I hope they realize that it's not a problem. They can reach out to me anytime. So, definitely, definitely, and that's something that I reiterated is that, you know, and I mean, and this is something. This is like a passion project for you. So, like, you don't, you can do something because you want to do it. You know, like you don't have to have a job in podcasting. You could, like, there's so many resources that you can do it on your own and develop your following, cultivate your audience, and promote your work. So, and I think you're doing a great job with that. So keep going. (laughs) Thank you so much. I appreciate it. (laughs) Yes, you're welcome. So that was a fun conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I know I got a lot out of that conversation with Taylor Shaw. Next week, I bring on my brother who I used to work with at Fox Sports 1340. And that is the one and only Joshua A. Vincent. Make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. I promise you, you will not want to miss this one. You don't want to miss none of these episodes because I'm going to go ahead and brag, humble brag, but all the guests have been phenomenal. They all have unique stories. And quite frankly, you can learn something from all of them. So if this is your first time listening, first and foremost, thank you and please go back and dig into the archives remember do not let anybody set up a glass ceiling that you will not let yourself break through this podcast was recorded and edited by b waters productions the music by hypno beats make sure you follow him at hypno underscore beats with a z on instagram